Welcome to this week's episode of the Liberty Unveiled Podcast, formerly the Teshua Unveiled Podcast. I am your host, Brad Hopp, and I'm joined by my friend and co-host, Pastor Sam Jones. Together, we are unveiling liberty one episode at a time. We'll be discussing the latest in trafficking news, insider stories from those being delivered, and studying the Founder's Bible to learn how to return America to sanity and true freedom. Our sponsor for today's show is Teshua Tea Company. Visit TeshuaTea.com or DeliveranceTea.com. Hi, and welcome to the Liberty Unveiled Podcast. I'm your host, Brad Hopp, and as you can tell, Pastor Sam wasn't able to be here this week, my normal co-host. But uh, So I'm going to continue on with where we left off last week. We're going through the Founder's Bible. But for those of you that are just joining us that maybe are new to the Liberty Unveiled Podcast and you don't know what, exactly what we're all about, well, Liberty Unveiled is uh, the podcasting arm of our mission to show a tea company and to show a house and to show a house is our rescue mission in communist Asia where my business partner and, and good friend Andrew he and the team are rescuing underage girls out of sex trafficking they get the girls into our rescue and rehab facility where they teach them how to make bracelets and coasters and how to harvest and process tea and coffee they uh, teach them to read and write they give them a full education they help them get literate most of the girls that we're rescuing are illiterate um, some of the really cool stories is one of the girls uh, was was illiterate in her own language and now you know two years later now not only can she read and write in her own language but she's also learning Korean and so we're really proud of her one of our young ladies uh, graduated our program is now a licensed insurance agent so the work that we're doing is really making the impact these girls are going to be with us long term uh, and so they they have a lot of growing to do and a lot of uh, abuse to overcome you know because they were pimped out in the brothels for sometimes several years and um, so we have some amazing stories that we've shared on previous episodes so I encourage you to go back and listen to those but one of the really nice parts about what we're doing is we go through and we're we help the girls learn to do these different crafts and skills as far as making the bracelets and the coasters and the tea and the coffee and stuff and then we actually buy those products from the girls up front, giving them economic empowerment so that they then have resources to be able to go out on their own and stand on their own when they move away from our rescue facility. So uh, we really want them to be a well-rounded uh, person that's educated, that has work, uh, work skills, that knows how to start their own business or knows how to um, you know work in different industries and stuff and so that's really what we're all f we're focused on is is not just putting them in a halfway house and giving them a few you know counseling sessions or whatever but we want them to go out and to be able to be able to stand on their own and to be able to be a whole and complete person that is is released on the world and and will be a, a world shaker, a world changer in their local community. And, um, you know, as we get into this week's episode, we're going to be discussing uh, capital crimes in the Avenger of Evil. And as we discuss trafficking and as we discuss all these different issues, you know, a lot of times people go, um, you know... There's the tendency to say, well, I'd put a bullet in the person's head. And that's justified. And I want to say that very upfront, as far as the abusers. That would be a very justified response. But we were discussing some things last night in church. And we were discussing heaven and hell. And we were discussing, you know, why is God just in creating hell? Why was... Why was why is that part of God's justice? And why would God be just in sending people there? And this section that we're talking about really kind of encapsulates it and summarizes it and really goes to the point because God is just in meeting out her he's he's righteous in meeting out justice and punishment for wicked 
Because there comes a point in people's lives where they have so surrendered to wickedness and evil that they are unredemptive. But at the same time, and something that we've demonstrated time and time again, actually, at the same time, there are people who are abusers, um, who are brothel owners, who are, you know, what, what most would consider the scum of the earth. And yet, they've never heard the gospel story. And when they do, they become convicted of their sins and they have an opportunity to repent. And whether they become unredemptive or not depends on their response to that message. Because we all have the opportunity to either harden our heart or to... Um, and to harden our conscience and to sear our conscience or to uh, soften our heart and to soften our conscience and to, to receive the gospel. And one of the greatest stories about this whole thing, just a, a wonderful picture of it, two great, really picture, two really great pictures of it are the two brothel owners that Andrew and the team have led to the Lord. Um, one of the men Andrew sat down uh, with, and, and uh, he was introduced to Andrew uh, through uh, the girls that are actually now our house moms. Um, they had become Christians. They had gotten saved, and they would take gifts into the broth owners. And so they were sharing, you know, they were building relationship with the broth owners. They were building relationships with the girls in the brothel. And so they said to the brothel owner, they said, hey, do you want to meet an American that speaks your language? And he goes, well, heck, I've never been an American, let alone one that speaks my language, so sure. Well, this guy sat down with Andrew, and, and Andrew shared the gospel with him. And this gentleman became a Christian. He chose to soften his conscience and to respond to the gospel. And he chose to uh, become a Christian and to walk away from the lifestyle that he was in. And now he actually helps us rescue more girls. Well, now fast forward a couple of years and Andrew is introduced to another brothel owner and sits down with the gentleman at his office and, and uh, um, this guy chooses not to receive Christ for a year. And actually just over a year ago now, this gentleman, um, through a series of events, Andrew and, and uh, some of his Bible school students were praying one morning, and they felt like they needed to head north out of town, and they we've shared this story previously, but they headed north out of town and ended up 68 miles out in the middle of nowhere, north of town, right in front of this brothel owner's father-in-law and mother-in-law's house, and when they got there, his father-in-law comes up to the gate and, and uh, asks Andrew very gruffly what he's doing there and what's his business there. And Andrew doesn't really know what to say. And so they're standing there talking for a second. And, and uh, uh, the, the uh, elderly man's son-in-law walks out of the house and sees Andrew and stops dead in his tracks and, and, really, and recognizes Andrew. And he knows that Andrew has no idea where his in-laws live. He knows that Andrew has no idea how to find him. And uh, so they begin conversing, and Andrew shares the gospel with this guy again. And this brothel owner and his in-laws, all three of them become Christians, and they all get baptized that day. They all get their first Bibles that day. And that brothel owner chooses to turn around and set all of his girls free and, and relinquish them to us. And so we were able to rescue eight more girls that day. And, and you know, God is long suffering with us. And he is, we talk a lot on the show, <clears throat> excuse me, we talk a lot on the show about the Ten Commandments. We talk a lot about how 
obedience is is the sound that worship makes when we obey or rather obedience the sound of the love makes when we obey God's word we're showing him that we love him when we choose not to obey his word we're showing him that we don't love him and God says I will rain out my blessings on those who love me but he says I will also visit the iniquities of uh, you know of those that don't you know I will visit those iniquities on them and on their on their descendants and and what he's getting at is when we don't choose to honor God when we don't choose to obey when we don't choose to to live for him when we don't choose to show him these things then he really has no choice but to turn us over to our own our own devices and our own will and um, you know this is the reason for the gospel because the gospel gives us a chance to see ourselves in our fallen state it gives us the chance to see ourselves in the wickedness that we're in and it and it gives these these brothel owners it gives you know the girls it gives all of us it, it levels the playing field because we're all equal at the foot of the cross because we're all sinners we've all sinned we've all fallen short of the glory of god we've all you know um I watch Kirk Cameron and, and Ray Comfort sometimes on um, Way of the Master, and and uh, they'll be out doing street interviews with people, and, and invariably people say, "Well, you know, I'm a, I'm a good person," and uh, they say, "Okay, you know, have you ever told a lie?" and and the people always have to say yes, and they have to say, you know, or then they ask him, "Have you ever stolen anything?" and and usually 99% of the time people say yes, and. Uh, they look at him and say, "Well, have you ever looked at a, a person of the opposite sex, opposite sex, or looked at somebody and 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 lusted after them?" And, and invariably, everybody has to say yes. And they'll come back and they'll say, "You know, well, by your own admission, you you've told lies. What does that make you?" And then we'll say, "Well, a liar." Well, you told me you've stolen something. What does that make you? A a, a thief, you know. And you've told me that you've lusted after people. So what does that make you? The Bible says if you look after somebody to lust after them, you're an adulterer. And and so then the person goes, you know, and then Ray will ask him, you know, what does that make you? Well, it makes you a lying, thieving adulterer. And um, and so we all have to look at ourselves and we all have to say, yes, I'm, I've fallen short. But there's a redemption available. But if we choose not to accept that re that redemption, if we choose not to accept Jesus and the work that he did on the cross, then there is only one thing left. There's only punishment left. And and I'm going to have to ask your forgiveness. I have my heater running today because, well, it's cold out today. I think we were at a high of like negative five today or negative seven or something stupid like that. It's literally last night's over overnight temperature was like negative 20 something here. So, um this is say the heater's running today and actually have two of them going in here so um apologize for the background noise but we're going to get right into here and and that's you know before i do that's the beauty of of the work that andrew is doing is is we're not only seeing the girls come out of the brothels but we're also seeing the lives of the brothel owners transformed now do they have the ability to say no do they have the ability of of Rejecting the gospel? Absolutely. Are there Christians that, that think they're Christians and that, that have really, by and large, rejected the gospel that are going to get to heaven and say, well, you know, I did all these great things in your name, God, and, and he's going to go depart me from me. I never knew you. Because they never had their conscience renewed. They never, you know, they never really made Jesus the Lord of their lives. And in and so this next section here, I think, is really just a fantastic section to dive into. Um, and this is based on Deuteronomy 17.6, Capital Crimes and the Avenger of Evil. Genesis 6 describes the near unimaginable condition where the entire earth had become corrupt and all flesh, both man and beast, had corrupted their way. Verse 11. 
everything had become so corrupted and was so full of violence because of them that the end of all flesh was at hand. God decided that it was necessary to destroy them with a great flood and to preserve what he could. Why does hell exist? And I want to get into this before I read on here. Hell exists because God loves mankind, loves the ones that have chosen to accept him as Lord and Savior, the ones that have chosen to make him master and Lord, the ones that have chosen to obey. He loves them enough that he doesn't want them abused and beaten and violated by the violent ones that have not. So hell has to exist. Because if hell didn't exist, then hell, heaven would eventually become hell. If all the unrighteous and all the sinners and all the wicked got to go to heaven, <clears throat> you would see exactly what happened here happen in heaven. You would see what's happening right now in modern day America happen in heaven. We would, the violent and the wicked and the, the, the abusers, would eventually destroy heaven. God has to punish those that have chosen not to rely on him. So then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth, and that every intent of the heart of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. The Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. The Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, from man to animals to creeping things and to the birds of the sky. For I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah, but Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Verses 5 through 8. When the, light, when the flood had fulfilled its assignment, rescuing that which had not been corrupted or which had not corrupted its way, and eliminating the vast widespread and wanton wickedness that had characterized all the corrupted flesh of man, beast, and every living thing, God spoke to Noah and made an everlasting covenant with him. Genesis 9, 7-11 But immediately before making the, that covenant, God gave Noah one simple command to help guide the new, fresh, and clean world. From the hand of every man's brother, I will require the life of man. Whoever sheds, sheds man's blood, by man his blood shall be shed. For in the image of God he made man. Now, they're probably going to get into it, but I want to address something here. There is a difference, there is a big difference, between murder and a righteous execution of capital punishment. There is a big difference. God was very clear. Certain crimes against mankind were so heinous that they required the forfeiture of the life of the offender. From that time forward, it became a specific responsibility of civil government to protect innocent life and punish those who abridged that standard. If the life of an individual citizen was wrongly taken by another citizen, the lawbreaker, by his own actions, had given up his right to his own life by violating this very first societal law established by God himself. In the New Testament, the Apostle Paul reaffirmed this policy. For rulers are not a cause for fear or of fear for good behavior, but for evil. Do you want to have no fear of authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. For it is a minister of God to you for good. But if you do what is evil, be afraid, for it does not bear the sword for nothing. For it is a minister of God, an avenger who brings wrath on the one who practices evil. Romans, 9, or Romans 13, 3-4. God specifically gave the sword of civil justice to civil government, which does not bear the sword for nothing. Government is to wield and use that sword as an avenger who brings wrath on the one who practices evil. This New Testament passage confirms what God earlier said in Genesis 9, 5-6. Paul fully accepted this. 
even declaring at his own trial, If then I am a wrongdoer and have committed anything worthy of death, I do not refuse to die. Acts 25.11 Some today oppose capital punishment as a violation of the Ten Commandments directive, You shall not murder. Exodus 20 verse 13 and Deuteronomy 5.17 As some translations use the word kill, but scholar but all scholars agree that the original hebrew word in that verse is properly translated murder rather than kill murder means shedding innocent blood and in the scriptures god repeatedly denounces the shedding of innocent blood but capital punishment is the shedding of guilty blood and therefore does not come within the scope of that commandment against murder now before I continue on, people will, will oftentimes ask, well, what about Cain? You know, Cain killed his brother Abel, and yet he was not murdered. The re or he was not executed, rather. Not murdered, but rather executed for that murder. And the reason was because there was not a civil government in place yet. The reason that Abel or that Cain was marked by God was because it was to show that he had killed someone but there was not a civil government to punish Cain so therefore God operated within the bounds of the different spheres of judicial authority the family government self-government um, and civil government and, and since there was no civil government yet, God said these other two spheres, um, family government and, and self-government, don't have the authority over the civil government, or they don't have the authority of civil government yet. So therefore, they are not allowed to exact what would be a civil government responsibility. Every sphere of government has its place and position. God having established the use of capital punishment for certain crimes also provided safeguards against the abuse of that punishment. In Deuteronomy 17.6, he requires, On the evidence of two witnesses or three witnesses, he who is to die shall be put to death. He shall not be put to death on the evidence of one witness. Now, I want to address something here real quickly because and David might get into it here in a second, but one of the things that that was required of those witnesses was that they had to be truthful, because if they were lying on the on the on the stand, let's say that that two or three witnesses got together and they wanted to accuse somebody of murder, and so they all got together and, and were lying on the stand. If it was proven that they were lying on the stand to put an innocent person to death, then they were put to death. The justice was exacted the same. In other words, the punishment they were seeking to bring about on an innocent person would be exacted upon them because basically they were trying to use civil government to commit murder. But they were trying to do it through the court system. And they were trying to keep their hands clean by letting the court be the bad guy. So if a, if a witness was, to, was on the stand and was lying, they would be put to death. Biblically, the death penalty could not be applied unless there were at least two witnesses or two eyewitnesses to the event or the incident. Circumstantial evidence, even when strong, is not the equivalent of multiple eyewitnesses and therefore does not meet the biblical standard. Interestingly, however, the Bible long ago acknowledged a specific eyewitness that only in recent decades has become recognized in American courts. Recall the account of Cain's murder of his brother Abel from Genesis 4, 8 through 10. When God asked Cain where his brother was and Cain lied, God specifically confronted him with the, with the declaration, The voice of your brother's blood 
is crying to me from the ground. Verse 10. Blood cries out. Blood has a voice. How can that be? We now know that DNA has a voice. That it serves as an eyewitness to specific crimes. Just as when it cried out to God about Abel's death. This voice therefore biblically qualifies as one of the two or three eyewitnesses needed to secure the death sentence in a capital crime. Requiring two eyewitnesses before the death penalty can be applied is a genuine safeguard. There are certainly perjurers who will lie about an incident in order to harm someone, but it is extremely difficult to get two perjurers to tell the same lie about the same event. After all, remember that at the trial of Jesus, after hours of attempts, the liars were unable to get their lies about him to agree. Mark 14, 55 to 56. Intentionally cold-blooded murder was a crime that historically was always considered worthy of death, as in Genesis 9. But treason was another crime to which the death penalty was universally applied. Why? As explained by U.S. Supreme Court Justice uh, Henry Brockholst Livingston, a military officer during the American Revolution appointed to the court by President Thomas Jefferson. Treason not only holds as cons a conspicuous and generally the first place in every catalog of crimes, but is almost universally punished with death. Government is so high a blessing in its preservation and support are so essential to the welfare of every member of the body politic that to attempt its subversion has ever been regarded a most uh, aggravated offense. Founding Father Noah Webster agreed, declaring, Treason is the highest crime of a civil nature of which a man can be guilty. Why would treason be a greater crime than murder? Because treason typically resulted in mass murder. It opened a nation to foreign invaders who could only seize control by killing enough inhabitants to force the nation to relinquish itself to the conquering power. The Bible records numerous occasions of treason, including Korah against Moses, Numbers 16, 1 through 33, Rahab against Jericho, Joshua 2, 1 through 24, Absalom against King David, 2 Samuel 15, Jeroboam against King Rehoboam, 1 Kings 2, 16 through 19, and many others. Throughout the Bible, the penalty for treason was consistently death. See, for example, when Mordecai uncovered the treason in Esther 2.23. Recall, too, that Jesus was crucified for treason. He was called a king and was thus considered a rival to the Roman emperor. The sign posted above his head when he was crucified therefore identified his offense as being king of the Jews. Matthew 27.11 and 29. Uh, Luke 23, uh, verse 38. Paul faced a similar treason charge for saying that Jesus was a king. Acts 17, 7. Because treason was such a serious threat to the existence of a nation, it is directly addressed in the U.S. Constitution, Article 3, Section 3, Paragraph 3. Notice the explicit provision associated with convicting someone of the capital crime of treason. No person shall be convicted of treason unless by the testimony of two witnesses to the same overt act or on confession in open court. Significantly, the Constitution did not allow the death penalty to be applied to this capital crime unless there were two witnesses to the same overt act. The identical st uh, safeguards set forth in Deuteronomy 17.6. Article 3 is another of the many clauses in the Constitution that incorporates specific provisions from the Bible. So that's the end of that section. Now, long before Israel demanded their first king, Moses detailed in advance as to how to choose their own leaders. Specifically, a foreigner could be a governor over a tribe or an elder of a nation, but or of an of the nation, but not the top national leader. The national leader was to be native-born, one from among your countrymen. 
Did you know that the Founding Fathers placed this identical biblical requirement in the Constitution as regards uh, as regards the office of the President? A natural-born citizen. You might also be surprised to find out that Israel was set up as a republic, a model that did not escape the Founders' notice. Deuteronomy 19, Courts of Justice. The Bible established specific procedures to be used in courtroom proceedings, and the objective of each was to secure justice. For example, Deuteronomy 19, 15 through 18 stipulates, A single witness shall not rise up against a man on account of any iniquity or any sin which he has committed. On the evidence of two or three witnesses, a matter shall be confirmed. If a malicious witness rises up against a man to accuse him of wrongdoing, then both the men who have the dispute shall stand before the Lord, before the priests and the judges, who will be in office in those days. The judges shall investigate thoroughly. Many other scriptures address courts, judges, and legal proceedings, and all pointed to the same purpose, securing justice. Many other scriptures address courts, judges, and legal proceedings, and all pointed to the same purpose, securing justice. Significantly, the due process clauses of the U.S. Constitution, the Fourth through the Eighth Amendments, also contain specific provisions to secure justice in court proceedings, and those provisions are based heavily on Bible teachings. This fact is affirmed even by modern Supreme Court justices who are not at all considered religious, but who nevertheless make this acknowledgement simply because the history is conclusive. In the millennia preceding the American colonization, courts have been used as a political enforcement machinery. Justice was definitely not their objective. In the 15th and 16th centuries, many of the dissenters, those who followed biblical teachings and opposed the corruption of the state-run churches, have been tried, convicted, and punished by these tyrannical courts, and they began pointing out biblical passages that illustrated the proper use of courts. But after decades of continued judicial persecution and cruelty, and no success in securing judicial reform, large waves of dissenters departed Europe for America, specifically citing the judicial corruption of European courts as a reason for leaving. Upon their arrival, the dissenters took deliberate steps to ensure that the judicial system here excluded the, pro excluded the problems and practices that had characterized the English judicial system. They believed that one of the most effective means of securing justice was by use of juries, a practice largely excluded in Europe. Originally, jurors, original jurors in America exercised power far beyond those of modern jurors who today often serve as not much more than spectators in a court watching so-called legal experts perform in front of a robed referee. Originally, American jurors were considered to be citizen judges who not only watched over the robed judge and attorneys, but who were especially committed to ensuring that justice was done in every courtroom. From the beginning, American juries had a twofold responsibility. Number one, examine the facts in a particular case. And number two, judge the law at the center of the controversy. They understood that if a law was tyrannical, enforcing it would prevent justice rather than secure it. We have fallen a long ways from that. Consider what would have occurred if Daniel in the Bible had been a defendant in these early American courts. In Daniel's case, a law had been passed declaring that prayers could be offered to no one but King Nebuchadnezzar. Daniel broke the law, prayed to the one true God, and was arrested. Daniel 6, 7-16 er, through 16. If that case had been brought before an American jury, in a court of justice during the 1600s, 1700s, or 1800s, Daniel would have been immediately acquitted. The law under which he was being tried would have been adjudged, unjust, and despotic, violating Daniel's inalienable right to pray to his God according to the dictates of conscience. Even if the judge had told the jury 
that Daniel had definitely violated a clearly written law, and the jury must therefore return a verdict of guilty. The judge's instructions would have been ignored. The jury was a check and balance on the judge to ensure that justice was done, and therefore it had the right to judge both the law and the facts. Juries in early America often shone brightly in this regard. For example, during the Massachusetts Witch Trials of, seven, of 1691 to 1692, 19 defendants were convicted and sentenced, and eight others died in prison as a result of awaiting trial. But then juries stood up and acquitted or released the next 52 defendants, often in opposition to direct instructions given to them by judges. In 1735, uh, newspaper publisher Peter Zenger of New York was taken to trial for his printed attacks against Governor William Cosby. British law at the time forbade anyone from criticizing a British official, even if the criticism was truthful and valid. The judge therefore instructed the jury to convict Zenger for criticizing the governor, but the jury ignored the judge and acquitted Zinger, believing that any law that punished citizens for telling the truth was unjust. As the American Revolution approached, American juries refused to convict defendants under the British Navigation Acts, which treated American merchants and entrepreneurs as smugglers and criminals. The British responded by creating courts of admiralty, from which juries were excluded and in which the accused was often considered guilty until proven innocent. John Adams denounced this as the most grievous innovation and thundered, in these courts no judge presides alone or one judge presides alone. No juries have any concern there. No juries, thus no guarantee of justice. When America separated from Great Britain, the founders specifically enshrined juries in, in both the federal and state constitutions. To ensure justice was secured, juries were empowered to judge both the law and the facts. Therefore, in American courts, attorneys and judges argued all issues about the law and evidence in, pre in the presence of the jury so that the juries would be privy to all the facts. As one legal expert observed, judge and jury heard the same evidence and might disagree in interpreting it, but in the years leading up to the 20th century, a dramatic shift occurred, with courts of justice devolving into courts of law. Upholding the law replaced the pursuit of justice. The impetus for this change was a series of jury decisions against megacorporations and monopolies of that day after which several powerful legal groups began lobbying Congress and the Supreme Court to limit the powers of juries. In 1895, the Supreme Court ruled that juries would no longer consider the law in a case, but only the facts. No longer would they serve as a check against the tyranny of a bad law. Rather, they would only be asked to decide whether an individual had violated a law, even if that law was unjust. In that same period, Congress passed a law birthing the federal court systems. Excuse me. Um, in that same period, Congress passed a law birthing the federal courts of appeal system. There had previously been no need of such a system. For juries had always been the final word. In the new Federal Court of Appeals system, judges began telling one another and the judges below them what the law was. Judges, judges had taken control of the law and become its sole interpreters. Juries were still involved, but the judges now controlled the juries. Juries were no longer to privy, all, privy to all the facts and evidence and many of the legal arguments began to occur outside of their presence, either in the judge's chambers or in written arguments to which the jury was no longer given access. Juries received only the information that judges allowed them to know. The judge had replaced the jury as the most powerful force in the courtroom. Consequently, 
Had Daniel been tried it by a 20th century court of law, he definitely would have been convicted. The judge would have told the jury what the law was, that Daniel had violated the law, and he must therefore be convicted. Nothing was more important than following the law as interpreting or as interpreted by judges. In fact, if a jury tried to ex exercise its traditional historic role of considering not just the facts, but also the law, judges were there or were told to declare a mistrial or overturn the jury verdict. In the latter part of the 20th century, yet another devolution uh, occurred, this time moving downward from courts of law to nothing more than courts. According to current legal definitions, a court is now merely a, a locale or a body to settle disputes. Securing justice was the original objective of courts. Then it shifted to upholding the court of or upholding the law. But now it is merely settling disputes and ending arguments. Hence, modern courts have shown an eagerness to strike down laws that stand in the way of settling dis a dispute, preferring instead to impose their own judicially crafted policy that they have that they believe best ends the argument. Under this arrangement, the people's role in the judicial system is the smallest it has ever been in the history of the Republic, and justice has been the casualty. But justice is important. It is a biblical concept, and not surprisingly, since so many core components of traditional justice are biblically derived, as America has become increasingly secular over the past century, the pursuit of justice has diminished. Americans need to regain the knowledge and understanding of biblical prov provisions for justice in the courts. They should also seek and accept every opportunity to serve on a jury, for biblical-minded citizens serving in courtrooms can help restore justice. Okay, so continuing on, um, we're moving over to Deuteronomy 24. And we're going to be switching subjects here a little bit. Deuteronomy 24. How we are to help the poor. The commentary accompanying Deuteronomy 15 examined God's directives about who should care for the poor. In this chapter, God gives instructions about a different facet of care for the poor. He told the people, When you reap your harvest in your field and have forgotten a sheaf in the field, you shall not go back to get it. It shall be for the alien for the orphan, and for the widow, in order that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hands. When you beat your olive tree, you shall not go over the boughs again. It shall be for the alien, for the orphan, and for the widow. When you gather the grapes of your vineyard, you shall not go over it again. It shall be for the alien, for the orphan, and for the widow. Deuteronomy 24, 19-21 and it was first given in Leviticus 19, 9 to 10, and 23, verse 22. Any grain left in the field, any olives on the trees, or any grapes on the vines were to be for the poor. And God also made other provisions for the poor, commanding. But on the seventh year, you shall let it rest and lie fallow, so that the needy of your people may eat. And whatever, you, whatever they leave, the beasts of the field may eat. You are to do the same for your with your vineyard and your olive grove. God had already required that man must have a Sabbath, a seventh day that he took off for the purpose of rest. But now he required that the land also have a Sabbath, and that anything that grew on the land in that year was for the poor. In each of these many ways, God had made provision for the poor. But notice that the poor always had to do the work for themselves to collect those provisions made available to them. That is, the harvesters left sheaves and rounded off the corners of the field while harvesting. But if the poor were to have that food, they had to carry out the extra sheaves and harvest the corners for themselves. Similarly, the poor had to pick the remaining clusters off the vines and to collect the grapes that fell in the vineyard. They had to gather the remaining olives from the trees. And everything that grew on the prop on any property in its Sabbath year had to be harvested by the poor if they were to partake of its food. 
God had made opportunities for the poor, but work was always required in exchange. After all, the Bible commands, if anyone is not willing to work, then he is not to eat either. 2 Thessalonians 3, uh, 10. Of course, this the exception to this was orphans, widows, and the disabled who were truly unable to work. If they were physically unable to supply for themselves, charity was supplied or provided for them. This biblical policy was what was adopted or is what was adopted in America. In fact, when Benjamin Franklin was in London, he wrote a newspaper piece criticizing the English practice of providing for the poor by taxing citizens. Oh, that sounds like what we do today. Direct, both directly taxing their incomes and also indirectly taxing commodities sold and bought by them. I think Benjamin Franklin would criticize us today. Franklin rebuked them for that approach, explaining, I am for doing good to the poor, but I differ in opinion of the means. I think the best way of doing good to the poor is not making them easy in poverty, but leading or driving them out of it. In my youth I traveled much, and I observed in different countries that the more public provisions were made for the poor, the less they provided for themselves and of course became poorer and on the contrary the less was done for them the more they did for themselves and became richer there is no country in the world where so many provisions are established for them so many hospitals to receive them when they are sick or lame founded and maintained by voluntary charities so many alms houses for the aged of both sexes uh, together with the solemn general law made by the rich to subject their estates to a heavy tax for the support of the poor. Under all these obligations, are our poor modest, humble, and thankful? And do they use their best endeavors to maintain themselves and lighten our shoulders of this burden? On the contrary, I affirm that there is no country in the world in which the poor are more idle dissolute, drunken, and insolent. The day you passed that act, you took away from before their eyes the greatest of all inducements to industry, frugality, and sobriety. In short, you offered a premium for the encouragement of idleness, and you should not now wonder that it has had its effects on the increase or in the increase of poverty. Repeal that law and you will soon see a change in their manners. St. Monday and St. Tuesday will cease to be holidays. Six days shall out labor. Exodus 2 or Exodus 20 verse 9. Though one of the old commandments long treated as out of date will again be looked upon as a respectable precept, industry will increase and with it plenty among the lower people. Their circumstances will, um, will mend and more will be done for their happiness by inuring them or enabling them to provide for themselves than could be done by, by dividing all your states among them. Franklin listed several bad, ha bad fruits that resulted when biblical method of caring for the poor was not followed. An increase of poverty, ungratefulness, laziness, higher taxes, with no resulting benefits. The Founding Fathers were very concerned about helping the poor, but they were equally concerned about doing it in a biblical manner. As noted earlier, in the commentary accompanying Deuteronomy 15, Thomas Jefferson and George Washington were both very generous with their personal charity, and both were leaders in organizing the community to care for the poor, but both were also insistent that whatever the poor receive must not encourage laziness or idleness. As Jefferson observed, an industrious farmer occupies a more dignified place in the scale of beings, whether moral or political, than a lazy lounger, valuing himself 
on his family. Too proud to work and drawing on a miserable existence by eating on that surplus of another of other men's labor. And when, Je when Washington had given instructions to his business manager at Mount Vernon, he told them, let the hospitality of the house with respect to the poor be kept up. Let no one go away hungry. If any of this kind of people should be in want of corn, supply their necessities, provided it does not encourage them in idleness. God definitely cares for the poor. And he tells them, or tells us to do the same. But he also establishes clear principles for how that assistance is to occur. And it requires some type of effort from the poor. So we're going to finish up there today. But I think that ties in fantastically with the mission of Teshua Tea Company. But just because Teshua is really all about encouraging the young ladies that we rescue who literally come to us with only whatever they have on their back or don't have on their back that is all they come to us with they come to us with nothing if they were carried out of the brothel naked that's what they have when they come to us if they come out with a few articles of clothing on that's what they come to us with and we give them the medical care, the clothing, the toiletries, everything they need to get established. But then they're given an education, but then they also have to work in either the tea shop in the, in the, at the rescue house or that the rescue house runs, or they have to learn to run the CMC machine, or they have to learn to make the bracelets and the coasters and how to harvest and the process and the tea, process the tea and the coffee. But then we come alongside and buy those products from them so that they're able to have or exchange their goods and services for economic value. They learn to be industrious and they learn to provide for themselves. And that is why the magical, that's what the magical power of tissue is all about. We don't want to just hand them things. We, yes, we, we, we provide for for their you know food and shelter and, and and stuff while they're with us but at the same time we're teaching them how to be industrious and they're told you're not going to live with us forever you need to have these skills and abilities so that you have the ability to stand on your own and we're doing what the founding fathers of america would have encouraged the poor amongst our nation to do we're doing what the Bible commanded the poor or the, the nation of Israel to do for their poor, to teach them to be industrious, to teach them to stand on their own. And that's why I'm so proud of Andrew. I'm so proud of the team. I'm so proud of what they're doing. And I'm so proud of what we've been able to put together with Teshua Tea Company. And that's why as we begin to branch out into other countries, Nigeria or, um, you know, Iraq or Iran or, or whatever, wherever God may lead us. Um, Thailand with our Thai coffee that we're bringing in, we're teaching the poor to be industrious. We're teaching them to put the hand their, their hand to the plow. You know, and if you think about it, you know, I was thinking about this while we were while we were, while I was reading. You know, that seventh year, the the six years they were to glean and and to the the harvesters were to round off the corners of the fields. And they were to leave the corners for the for the uh, for the poor, and so the poor could come along and they could harvest the corners of the field, and they could come back and they could harvest the grapes and they could harvest the harvest the olives that remained on the vine. But then, in the seventh year, everything was left to the poor. If the poor went out and worked the fields, they could go out and reap, and they could go out and harvest, and they could do what they needed to do. But what did that give them an opportunity to do? It gave them an opportunity to take those goods that they had harvested, that they had worked for, and to go out and sell those goods and be able to either buy their own land or to, to take that money and to put it into bettering their life. So God created a system, much like Teshua has done, 
we're really following his his precepts because we're taking care of them for those those years where they need our help but they have to they have to provide they have to supply and they have to put their hand to the plow but then in the seventh year they're putting their hand to the plow and now they're learning to stand on their own and now they're able to go out and and they are able to exchange the goods and services that they've created for profit for finances to be able to stand on their own and so you know i hope you'll join us along on this journey because i'm really extremely excited about what what's happening with the young ladies that we're working with I'm really excited for the villages that we're working with in Thailand, and I'm really excited for what we're going to be able to do with Judd and his people working in Nigeria. Our friend Judd Saul, we've had him on the show previously, and we're going to have him on again. Um, you know, and there are some things that we need to come alongside and provide for, for especially for our brothers and sisters in Nigeria, things that they need to be able to defend themselves and be able to um, stand on their own. So I hope you'll join us on this journey. Please stop by TeshuaT.com or DeliveranceT.com. That's T-E-S-H-U-A-H-T-E-A.com or DeliveranceT.com. Stop by and visit the store and pick up some our tea or coffee. Um, Andrew is going to be heading back overseas here in about a month, so we're really excited for that, and we'll be able to get uh, shipments of, of the the pour coffee again and we'll be able to get shipments of the teas again and stuff so it's been an absolutely crazy year with covid and everything else shutting down and whatnot so so we're really excited for that to be able to reopen and stuff please like and subscribe and share um that really helps us get the word out and and leave us a comment i really do read all the comments um you know if you send us an email i reply to the emails and stuff and and so i look forward to hearing from you Thank you very much for joining us on this week's show. Have a blessed week. God bless. Bye-bye. You've been listening to the Liberty Unveiled podcast, setting captives free one episode at a time. The Liberty Unveiled podcast is a part of the Unresolved Podcast Network and has been brought to you by Teshua Tea Company, T-E-S-H-U-A-H-T-E-A.com or DeliveranceTea.com.